We've said for years and years that the rehabilitation for people with EDS and height mobility has been far too, far too musculoskeletal when in fact it should be more neurological. I've said that for years and to be honest, if we have a look at this video, and see where she ended up by the end of a program. <laughs> That's from working neurologically, not musculoskeletally. Musculoskeletally, muscle tone, strength, stability, it all has its place. But first and foremost, brain is king. Hello and welcome to this video on rib subluxations for the hypermobile. If you're here on this video, you've more than likely come from thefibreguy.com from our blog post about this topic. And more than likely, you're here because you're looking for some of the mapping techniques and mobility drills to help you stabilize your rib cage in a way that's gonna have long lasting effects. If however, you haven't read that blog post, please click the link in the description below and have a read just so you can have some context around what we're talking about here today. So let's get into rib subluxation. Rib subluxations come with three unfortunate friends. The first being sleep disturbances. If you have a sublux rib, what you're gonna find is that it's very difficult to get a good night's sleep. And if we look at the research from the last 30 years on the topic of sleep and pain, we find that when we have sleep disturbances, our chances for pain dramatically rise. We also find that it's gonna lower our pain threshold, and more importantly, it's gonna affect our innate ability to release our own pain-killing chemicals. So this is a pretty big issue for people with rib subluxations. The second unfortunate friend is issues like costochondritis, wherein the costal cartilages that connect to the sternum become inflamed. Again, this is gonna cause a lot of issues and it's gonna make day-to-day -day living quite difficult. Generally, issues like costochondritis are gonna push us into our third unfortunate friend, which is protective behavior. A good example of protective behavior is when we look at people with chronic lower back pain and they essentially become mechanically coupled. This is where the thorax and the pelvis essentially lock together to slow the rotation of the trunk. This allows people to feel a little bit more stable and it reduces movement considerably to avoid future injury. The only problem is when we have individuals from the high mobility population adopt these protective behaviors, it means that whilst yes, the tissue, the muscle is guarded and it is tense, we lack the counter rotation of movement. Our hips are gonna move regardless of how much we tense because of our legs coming forward, which means we're gonna have greater pull forces from the tissue, okay? Just from the mechanics of walking. And whilst the tissue is, is contracted and it's in a guarded response, that doesn't mean that things like cartilage, remember cartilage is two-thirds collagen, and tendons and ligaments aren't gonna move. This poses a risk for things like our ribs slipping and accidentally impinging nerves like the intercostal nerves. Behind me is a map of the UK. And like all maps, each point represents a place in the real world, and you are no different. Each part of your body has a representation within your brain. We call this your cortical maps. This is your brain's ability to locate and move and sense what's going on in the world around us. It maps your joints, it knows where your joints are. So when your elbow moves into a specific position, things like mechanoreceptors, Golgi tendon organs, muscle spindles, they all send sensory information to your brain to let your brain know what's going on. Along with visual feedback, you help to update and coordinate your movement in the real world. However, if my daughter was to come in here and crayon and draw on my map, I would find it quite difficult to find certain parts of the map. And the, the same thing is true for you with height mobility and your map. There are lots of things that help us to update our maps and our representation of our body, helping our brains to stabilize our joints in good time. But there's also a lot of things that will impair that and create what we call cognitive smudging or cortical smudging or blurring or whatever else you want to call it. Inaccuracies is my favorite because that's a little bit closer to the truth. For me to use my map of the UK, if I want to find Shropshire, I know it's near Wales. I have certain landmarks to help me identify places. Okay, there's Wales, there's Shropshire. The same is true for you. Your brain will use other body parts to help identify specific sections of it that it wants. The issue we have is these inaccuracies. The more inaccuracies we start to gather, the more smudged our map becomes, and what happens is we start to dislocate more. 
Here at the fiber guy, we call this the subluxation dislocation cycle. And I'm going to explain that to you now. And hopefully it's going to make a lot of sense to you. And you're going to start to understand why you've been kind of going further down the pain hole. So one of the things that causes inaccuracies within our cortical maps is nociceptive signals. So we used to call nociceptive signals back in 1664 pain receptors. In fact, there's still a lot of people that do, unfortunately. However, in 1664, when we first created the Cartesian model of pain, we were still burning people at the stake as witches. Science has come on a long way, and we need to let these outdated kind of models of pain just die. There are, in essence, no nerves in your body that send signals of pain to your brain. We know that now. We have the research to show that. We know pain is an output based upon many, many different biological, psychological, social factors all working and mediating each other to produce pain. There are no pain signals that come in. Unfortunately, René Descartes, who coined the Cartesian model, he called nociceptors pain receptors, and this is where this, we confuse pain and nociception. This is where we get this kind of misnomer from. So nociceptors are special high threshold nerves that detect noxious stimulus. Noxious stimulus could be anything that might be potentially dangerous for you. So, extremes in temperature, vibration, pressure, and pertinent to height mobility, stretch. Because when we dislocate a joint, what happens is we pull on ligaments. We activate nociception. That tells the brain, hey look, something potentially dangerous. I wouldn't normally bother you, but this is pretty dangerous. And our brains can decide whether to or whether not to bother producing pain. And this is what we call nociceptive pain. The pain you'll generally experience from subluxations. The only issue is these nociceptive signals, think of them as a little bit as white noise, static. When they hit our brain regions, they interfere with how well we can see the various representations of our body. And what happens is the more nociceptive signals we've got, the more blurred our map of that body part starts to become. This is important because if your brain doesn't know where the body part is, where this joint is located, what it's near to, how much range, what position it's in, then it cannot stabilize it. You can override this. If anybody has ever stubbed their toe on a coffee table, you'll know you can override this. You stub your foot on the coffee table, nociceptive signals fire off to your brain, you produce pain, oh, and the first thing you wanna do is you wanna get your foot and you wanna rub your foot. It's an innate response and it's a very good one because when we rub it, we activate things like mechanoreceptors and they compete with the nociceptive signal and they help to dial it down, drown it out a little bit. So you'll probably notice from the shift in the fiber type, when you first stub your toe, it's a very sharp, very sharp pain. But after you've rubbed it and you start to drown the signals, change the fiber type, it becomes more of a low grade throbbing type. There's a lot of things that cause these inaccuracies, but nociception is definitely by far probably the biggest one. And the only issue is that when we do dislocate the joint, we essentially send these signals up, it creates inaccuracies in our brain, and it means that we're at a higher risk of subluxing more because our brain is less aware of the joints. Remember when I said this isn't about consciousness, it's not about being aware of what your body's doing, it's about your brain knowing where it is, and this is what we mean. So when it comes to things like mapping, we need to help the brain update that cortical map. And whilst there are great many ways to do it, a lot of them are required to see you in, in person to do because it's took us over 10 years to develop them. I want to explain to you three that will really help. Any kind of sensory information, rich sensory information, things like touch, tape, it provides what we call ta a tactile cue. And a tactile cue is going to help you create what we like to call in the studio a crude map. This is a very basic temporary map that can help you to start stabilizing the joints straight away. Only problem is it's quite temporary and it's very crude. It's like if I asked my daughter to draw me a map of the UK, it's probably not going to be as detailed as this. However, if I asked a third year uni, a third year art uni student to do the same thing, it's going to come back a lot more detailed. And this incredibly detailed map is what we want at the end of our journey. So this is kind of mapping in a nutshell. Any kind of sensory information that comes in, that's going to be fantastic because it's going to help retrain our brain to know where the joint is, but it's temporary. The second important thing is any kind of motor control. When we do a movement and our brain predicts what's going to happen, 
Every time it is wrong, we get what we call a prediction error and your brain has to recalibrate things. And this is a good way for us to start to recalibrate that map and to start detailing it a little bit more. And the third, probably most important for the earlier stuff, is what we like to call predictive coding. Your brain not only maps your entire body, but it also maps the outside world. You'll, you'll, you'll know this from anybody who's lived before cell phones and mobile phones around, when somebody will say, Adam, have you got the time? And you go, yeah. Oh, and you realize you didn't actually look at the watch. What you, uh, you didn't actually look at the time, you just looked at the watch. What happens is I come into the home office on a morning, boot up the computers, I look around and my brain goes, whiteboard, calendar, computer, desk. It doesn't go, oh, what's the texture of the whiteboard? What color of the wall? What? It just logs it as this is this, this is this, this is that. And this predictive coding is quite important because we can start to build negative connotations around things like moving and our joints as a whole. I won't get too much into this one because it does get very complicated. And I know you're here because we just want to go through some simple mapping techniques. But now that I've explained a little bit about mapping, let's get into the actual tactile cues and the mobility drills that you should be doing. To begin, you're going to need something that we can use as a tactile cue to get some good sensory information in and up to the brain to help with that creation of the crude map. What I would recommend is something like this. I'll stick a link in the description below or a Theraband. These are ridiculously cheap and they last forever. This one's about a decade old. So to start with, what we're going to do is add a little bit of tactile cue to the spine and to the ribs. Okay, take your band, you're just going to step into it and this is going to go up and over. If you are a bit sensitive on the neck area, kitchen towel, just wrap around, bath towel, just gives you a bit more kind of cushion. But we're going to come up and we're going to go over. This is important. So if I was to relax now, I'm straight into flexion, okay? This is going to give us our brain, it's going to trick it somewhat because we've got excess external force pulling us into flexion, which means that our brain's going to pick up on that and go, oh, we need to use the spinal erectors more. And you're going to find, you're going to be able to connect to those spinal erectors and use them a little bit better than you normally would if you didn't have the tactile cue. So in this position, you're not focused on pulling your shoulder blades back or any other craziness. I simply want you to focus on leading with the sternum. So the sternum goes up. You take a big breath in. You hold for a couple of seconds. It goes back out. Okay. After one or two of these, you're going to feel your spinal erectors working. That's totally normal. You're not going to be used to using them in this fashion. So you are going to get slight kind of discomfort, slight burning. But every time we breathe in and we lead with the sternum, okay, what I want you to really focus on is not just lifting your ribs like this or like that, but laterally as well. So we've got three dimensions of movement. So we'll go in. And we're out. Try not to hyperventilate yourself when you're doing this, but just really give yourself, give yourself a chance to just expand the ribcage and let it go back down with a nice bit of tactile cue. So we're in and we're out. It's important that when we are lifting and leading by the sternum, we're not rigid and regimented. It's just a relaxed lift and we're out. One of the issues we see a lot with height mobility especially when it comes to rib subluxations, is that people, when they're moving, aren't relaxed. They're rigid. It's that mechanical coupling that we talked about, okay? And what happens is when you're moving like that, if you lock down, you try and twist, the muscles are gonna keep you in the same place and all the cartilage, all the ligaments is gonna be pulled. What we need is stability with a bit of softness, okay? Nice, gentle, fluid, autonomous movement. Okay, lots of counter rotation because that allows us to use our body how it was meant to be used. And a good example of this is if I was to grab Bob off the high street and I said, Bob, come with me. We're going to go for a mile and a half brisk walk. Lots of counter rotation going on. We're walking with a bit of purpose, a bit of speed. After a mile and a half, how do you feel, Bob? Yeah, I feel, feel quite awake. But if I waited a month and went, Bob, come to me to the Hancock Museum, we're going to do about a mile and a half around the museum. What you would find is Bob would be knackered by the time we finished it. His feet would probably hurt, his back might be a bit aching. Although he's done the same amount of distance 
and he's done it over a much longer period of time, he has been moving differently. In his brisk walk, he's counter-rotating. He's using the force that he puts into the floor, and the ground reaction and the braking force that comes back. He's using that to recycle his energy and his force, making walking far more easier. Walking around the Hancock Museum, stop. We've just got force, boom, dead stop. Because we're walking at a much slower, much kind of pitter-patter speed, pitter-patter type of gait. So with something like this, guys, seriously, don't overthink it. Relax, you don't want to be focused on it too much, but just lead in. Just let the band do the work, let your brain do the work. You don't need to be super conscious about what's going on. Just focus on getting some big breath in, opening up those ribs, showing your brain that it's safe to have this expansion with the lungs. So let's move on to the next one. As with all of these, don't worry too much about repetitions. We're more concerned about time because time is something very, very tangible and time isn't gonna change throughout the day. A minute will always be a minute, but different factors, some in our control, some with outside of our control, they will affect how we're feeling that day, how many we can do. So don't worry about repetitions, just go for time, okay? I would say two, three minutes each. So you saw our first one, second one, keep in mind this, so a lot of sagittal movement as our ribs expand forward, okay? A lot of frontal movement, but there's no transverse movement, okay? There's no rotation. This is important. About 95% of accidents happen in the transverse plane, the twisting plane. That's how people do their knees. That's how people do their ACLs. That's how people pop ribs out for twisting, okay? If I'm compressed and I'm down, okay? Watch how much I can rotate. Oh, it's difficult. I can get about there. But look what happens when I straighten my thoracic spine. I can get much further, much further. So if we have this thoracic spine, this ribcage that is moving, okay, and we're purposely restricting it, then that's not gonna help us in the long run because it means that our cartilage can shift, our ribs can move, and as well, if we think about the attachments at the vertebra at the back of your spine, as soon as we do this, our ribcage goes like that, our ribs go downwards and our shoulder blades, which attach to our ribs, start to point forward. We start to close the gap in the shoulder joint. It's not gonna help us in the long run. So good thoracic spine. Remember, your best posture is your next posture. There isn't a be all, end all posture for height mobility because you've got people who are height mobile who have horrific posture, have no pain whatsoever. You have people with height mobility who have the best posture, riddled with pain. Posture and pain don't correlate very well. So. Our transverse exercise, we're just going to step into it, we're going to hook it over. We've got a nice little bit of sensory information here and here. But more importantly, right leg is going to go forward. Okay, So if we're banded from the right shoulder to the left leg, right leg goes forward. Same for the other way, vice versa even. So if we're here, okay, all I want you to do, pop that sternum, and I just want you to rotate. Just hold it. Just come back down. You just rotate. You'll feel all the tissue on your lower back start to work. You feel it in your ribs. But just relax through it. It's just sensory. A little bit of sensory information in, a nice tactile cue. Just let your brain regions know what's going on because we've got extra pressure coming through, not just all the sensory information for things like mechanoreceptors and your muscle spindles. Just relax it. We're relaxing through. This is quite a regressed version. If you're feeling particularly kind of adventurous, you can pop it off. You can stick it on your foot and you can sling up this way. This way, we've kind of got some aspects from the first exercise. We've got this pulling us into flexion, but we're also resisting up and around. Nice and easy. Again, don't worry about reps. It's just time. We could do the other side. It looks exactly the same. Foot through, arm through, left foot forward, twist. Super easy. What I would suggest, whilst we've got this on as well, is make it a little bit more transferable, okay? This is important, because when we look at some of the exercises and some of the proprioception techniques out there, things like breath work, they're not transferable because you're not focused every day on how you're breathing. It's just not a thing. People don't generally focus on whether they're breathing or not, OK? 
quicker and some of these techniques don't really have longevity with them. It's like you saying, Adam, please teach me the violin. And I say, perfect. Practice on this piano. It's, it's music, they're both music, but they're uh, very, very, very different, okay? So we'll get into our normal position. All I want you to do is to just focus on walking, okay? That's all you're doing, it's just super simple stuff. Not rocket science, more new science, but you get where I'm going with this, just relax with it. We're walking forward and we're moving. You've got this band to help give you feedback as you get to the end range, which will stop you from going too far, okay? Some of our banded stuff for knees, we see people in the studio who are like, oh, my knee hyperextends so badly, it goes all the way back. We band them up, they can't hyperextend anymore. It's physically impossible. So those are two nice little mapping techniques for you just to focus on. Again, it doesn't have to be crazy. You don't have to be out of breath when you do them. And we've said for years and years that the rehabilitation for people with EDS and height mobility has been far too, far too musculoskeletal when in fact it should be more neurological. I've said that for years. And to be honest, if we have a look at this video, and see where she ended up by the end of a program. <laughs> That's from working neurologically, not musculoskeletally. Musculoskeletally, muscle tone, strength, stability, it all has its place. But first and foremost, brain is king. So those are two really simple, really simple mapping exercises. Now I want to go through a little bit of mobility with you. We've just done two, two to three very simple mapping techniques just to give us a little update to a nice crude map just so we can lay the foundations for some joint stability and some rib stability okay now what we want to do is to mobilize the joint your areas are far more active now which means we're going to find this a little bit easier than we normally would in fact if you put your fingers if you're watching this put your fingers like this close your eyes and just sense left finger right finger you should kind of notice and feel them both the same you give them a little wiggle, you'll notice them both. However, if with your right hand, you give your right finger a little rub, okay? Give it a little scratch. Let's get a couple of mast cells out, a bit of histamine. Give it a little scratch, give it a squeeze. Fingers back, close your eyes. You'll notice you're drawn straight away to that finger that we've just rubbed. Because our brain is set up like a Christmas tree for the area that represents this finger. So when we focus on a little bit of tactile cues, a little bit of mapping work, helps to fire up that part of our brain that's dedicated to that body part. And when we do that, it makes it easier for us to stabilize it. And we get longer lasting effects. So now that, our crew is like a, now that our brain is like a Christmas tree, and we're quite aware of where the ribs are, let's add in a little bit more sensory information from the inside, from mobilizing it. So this is super simple. All you do is to put your hands and then rather than doing all this weird kind of craziness that you see a lot of people do, I want you to just keep your knees above your ankles and I want you to stick your butt out. So you see I've got a nice hinge, nice 90 degree angle, okay? Nice 90 degree or thereabouts. My palms are touching my kneecaps. Now, you don't need to go all the way down this low if you feel a bit more comfortable coming up to mid thigh, that's fine. A lot of people do, you can just stick like that. But what we do need to make sure is that we're not doing a pelvic tuck, where our pelvis is tucked under, okay? And we also want to make sure that we're not doing a pelvic tilt. We just want to be nice and relaxed, okay? Hinged from the hips. Then our hands are going to either go in the middle of the thighs or the knee. And all I want you to do in this position, super simple, really, really slowly, is I want you to relax, go into flexion from your thoracic spine, okay? So everything above your belly button can go into flexion. Everything below stays still, including the hips. Okay, so what you should do, you should look like that. Notice how here is still in the same position. What I didn't do and what a lot of people might do is this. Oh, okay, keep that bump tucked out. Keep the spinal rectus firing. And we're just relaxing. And we're up. And we're relaxing. So we're just warming up that thoracic spine. Now, lats, your latissimus dorsi. You have a tendency when they're really active to lock us down. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. If I go into this position here, okay, I put my arm across here and I lock my lat out. 
Watch what happens when I try to rotate. I can get about that far. But watch what happens when I relax my lats. I can get up much more. So when you're doing this, let's get into this position. We're going to relax that thoracic spine. We're going to go to flexing. We're going to straighten it up. We'll spend about a minute doing this. And then we're going into extension, not hyperextension, extension. And then we're just going to take this hand up. I'm just going to twist up to the left. And we're just going to relax. We're going to go back. Again, short, gentle, slow movements, just to let your brain know what's going on. You don't want to jump into something really aggressive because we have the tendency that some of these signals coming in might be deemed as nociceptive and we might get pain from it, which we definitely do not want. But they are some super, super simple exercises for you to just focus on. The most important ones are by far the mapping because if your brain doesn't know where your ribs are, when you do your mobilization exercises, it's not gonna help. What I would say, once you've done this, finish with something that kind of shows your brain in a predictive code and type way, that it's okay to do this. So what I would say is lie on the floor, on your back, with your legs, up on a couch or a bed. That'll allow your pelvis to just tuck under, that'll allow all the tissue of your lower back to just relax, and then you can let the, the power of gravity pushing down to just relax your spine, okay? If you do have a sublux rib, when you do that, you'll generally find you'll pop back in from that extension. But for me here at the Fiber Guy, guys, um, pleasure doing this video. Please let me know what you think. And if you want to cover mapping a bit more in depth, by all means, don't mind putting up some content that covers that. Also, if you want to take all of the confusion out of this, Come and see us either in studio, online. We'll go through the full map and framework. We'll get those joints stable. And we'll get back to letting you do the things you enjoy the most in life. Take it easy, guys. Bye.